who should be successful, but what? They're not successful. Why? So that's his why buy. But what is he afraid of? My personal style of education, but still entertain them, bring them along with stories, right? You can't wait to tell your colleague. You can't wait to go to work and tell somebody. And you're like, oh my God, I can't wait. So what happened? If you haven't seen my TV show, you should get cable. That's what we need to do. From doing a TV show to doing corporate events, I've been so lucky to connect with many passionate entrepreneurs worldwide. What I've learned from a business perspective, because this is the formula for success, no matter who you talk to, attitude will drive your behavior. Would you agree? and your behavior will drive your consequences every single time. Right, we got the concept. Okay, we got the concept. We got, we got the equipment, right? We got the brand, we guys got that. And then again, we got the content that we create. That's the easy part. This is the big one, the big C, which is the commitment. What should you do? That's right, all right. 10 Xers, do not fail me. True test, here it comes. There's skill, and then there's will. Listen to what I'm saying. There is skill, and then there is will. And here's the interesting thing. I know a lot of people who have a lot of skill, but have no what? Will, right? You ever look at somebody who's successful, and you say, why them, why not you? Yes, okay, that's me too. You have more control, but your costs are also gonna be what? Higher. Now, here's where some of the magic is starting to kick in. You can talk to any CEO in the B2B business, any CEO. You walk into his office and they only care about three things. People too. Yeah, he with the suit, put it up. There you go. I hope you can see this. I'll try to draw big. Let's pretend for a moment that I had seven territories. You remember I wrote that out? Yes or no? Boom, territory two, territory three, all the way to territory number one, seven. So now I've segmented my market. So content is going to start being created by machines. And I'm telling you right now that those people, you guys, the content creators that connect with people are the ones that are going to win. Some people think, well, it won't work for my industry. Really? It'll work for any industry. Trust me. The majority of the time when we're looking to fix something, repair something, or learn something, where do we go? YouTube. We don't even want to read anymore. We go to YouTube. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. When you're doing your thing, beautiful things begin to happen. It's like the law of attraction kicks in. You know what I mean? It's almost like you're in line with the universe. Everything works. And when you do your thing, everybody gets an automatic MBA, which stands for what? Mega bank account money. Are you with me? So we don't want to do a thing. We want to do a what? Beautiful. So you gotta start doing these things, pushing them, but also encouraging them. Oh, look at this. This work is dude, this is this is like so interactive with audience. Can you imagine this with your customers? Check this out. Now, what does all this have to do with selling? It has everything to do with selling. Welcome, everybody, to the Sales After Dark episode. I think we're up to 65 Sales After Dark because money never sleeps. 
Anyway, uh, if you're watching this on a replay, uh, I'm going to say hi to my friends here, which will be about five minutes, and then I'll jump into the content. And then, you know, I'll take some questions and answers at the end. Uh, today's topic, just look down there. Ooh, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be... Oh, it's going to be really good. Uh, I was super excited to find this interview and I'm like, oh, I got to share this with my tribe. So anyway, let me say hi to my peeps here. Brian Gator in the house, man. Las Vegas. Way to go, man. And there she is. West Coast Mia Knox. Always love having you here. Gary says, great promotional video. Well done, man. This gentleman by the name of Christo, man, I got to give him props, man, because I really love that. Uh, let me see if I can get up here. That's him. Christo. Cast Ahead Productions, man, he put together this video for me and, you know, show him some love, man. Say Chris Stone Rocks. Get it? Chris Stone Rocks. Put that in there, man. So Chris Stone, Cast Ahead. Um, Castahead.net is his website. Check it out. Uh, one of the coolest individuals. Great to work with him and, uh, as they say, worth every single penny, as they say. All right. Thank you for the new, yeah, I love it too, man. I love it too. Uh, great intro, man. I also like Jordan Peterson. This will be a very interesting topic. I'm with you, Inko. I think you'll like it. Pete, what's happening? Always glad to have you in the house. Natalie S. is in the house. Great opening. Thank you, Chris Stone. There we have Khaled. Hi, Victor and everyone. Hey, Khaled. I'm everything good here. Gator again. You guys are rocking there. TJ, good day, Master VA. Thank you for the reply to my email. See, once in a while, I do reply to emails. Uh... To the SAD peeps as well. Big day Monday, man. My man, TJ, is going after a big deal manana tomorrow, man. So send good vibes his way, man. He's trying to close this big deal, man. Let's see if we can do it, man. Let's see if you can do it, man. Juka, what's happening? Best part of the day, man. You're too cool, man. Yeah, it's a great intro, man. Thank you, Juka. Cup of tea, where have you been? I missed you. Hold on, it's my alarm here. Let me just stop that. And then let me see who else is there. Uh, cool outfit, man. Thank you. I'm a little casual. It's Sunday, man. My man, Ralph. Look, you got to go check out my man. So Waldo Waldman, uh, he's the, the wingman, right? So when you're looking for somebody to talk about leadership, uh, uh, he was a fighter pilot. So you have to check out his stuff. So Waldo, the wingman, great book. Uh, if you're looking for a great speaker, truly on leadership, man, this is the cat. He's a good guy, man. He's a real good guy. We had a good time at his, uh, I think it was like your 70s party or something like that, man. I love Jordan also, man. So it'll be a good conversation. Awesome promo. Jeffrey Anthony, thank you very much. Chris Stone, right back at you, man. It's all you. Uh, LinkedIn, Marcus in Houston, back at work after someone appreciated the value that I bring. Boom. Make, make them appreciate you, man. Chris Stone rocks. Jordan Peterson, Canada represents, man. He is. He's a Canadian, man. The, dude's, the dude, I think he's amazing, man. Uh, so happy to finally catch you live. Corey, glad you're here. I've been following you for years. Number one mentor. Thank you very much. That's very kind, man. Thank you very much. We have, uh, like the hype, Trinidad Tobago. Antonio, love it. Anybody with a name like Antonio's got to be cool in my book, man. So TJ, go get it. Says, uh, hi, Vic. First time live. You're the best. Chuck, welcome. It's going to be a good time, Chuck. Like I said, we're going to chop through this. Uh, good morning from Australia. Exciting. So it's got to be about 11 a.m. in Australia, man. So thank you for joining me. And Julian, Love your stuff. First time viewing your Sunday material. Sunday's like Mon like Tuesday, like Thursday. Well, Tuesday's Tech Tuesday. But anyway, uh, we got Camlish in the house. Also, welcome, Camlish. I know it's early where you're at. All right. I got to jump in this material, man. I, I got to jump in this material. Oh, I got one more. Love a cup of tea says what? I've been watching you later on the VOD. I've been very busy making money, I hope. Cup of tea, man. So it's always good to have you here. We got Tony Dearborn from Atlanta, the ATL in the house, man. Thank you for being a fan, man. All right, we're jumping into this material. Tony, you're the last one to get in. All right, so let me set this up. So I'm a fan of, like, Jordan Peterson. Uh, by the way, hit me with a one if you know who Jordan Peterson is. Just hit a one in the chat. And he's a clinical psychologist out of Canada, A. Eh? And, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe two, three years ago, I think he just got into a little... Uh, uh, tiff with the government uh, that was actually basically mandating that, uh, you know, people start using pronouns, right? And so they misrepresent him. He just kind of was like, you know, I don't like the government telling me what I can and cannot say. I'll respect people, but I don't need the government telling me that. That's my short version of it. But check him out. That's when I first heard of him. And since then, I've been following him. I started reading his 12 Rules for Life book. I've not finished it. It's a deep read, Matt. It's a really good read. It's a deep read. By the way, if you read 12 Rules for Life, 
just type in the number 12. Tell me you know you read the book. Uh, and then let me know what you think. Give it a thumbs up, a thumbs down. I think it's a great book thus far, right? And so he does a lot of interviews. And again, I think he's, he's like, a, he's like, to me, he's one of these modern day intellectuals that really dissects things and really tries to not take either side, really have a good conversation. A lot of 12s, people read the book, way to go. And so I really love listening to him because I really think he, he fights to stay objective and not subjective when it comes to talking about different topics, right? And so I was surprised to, to find this interview with a gentleman by the name of Rob Moore out of the UK, uh, the disruptive entrepreneur. So if you know who Rob Moore is, hit me with Rob if you know who he is. He's written several books, so he's a bestseller. Uh, I didn't know who he was, and I just came across this interview. You know how the uh, YouTube suggests videos? And so this topic was interesting because Rob Moore was gonna interview him. You know, uh, I guess we're gonna talk culture and politics, which is what Jordan usually talks about. Uh, I call him Jordan like we're homies, right? Yo, what up, Jordan? Yo, JP, what's up? So uh, anyway, so so when they got into it, you know, Rob is an entrepreneur, the disruptive entrepreneur. So he kind of threw the script down and says, you know what? Let's you and I have a conversation about entrepreneurialism. And what you know, ensued after that was a great conversation. I, I provided the link to Rob Moore's interview with Jordan right below. Uh, I'm telling you, worth the listen. It's about an hour long, but worth the, I should say, view. So check it out. So I'm giving credit what credit's due. This is Rob Moore's interview with Jordan Peterson. And I, I watched it and I'm like, I got to take some clips out of here and share it with my peeps because he got into sales and management. And some of the stuff in there was like, blew my hair back if I had hair, if you know what I mean, right? And so I, I, I prepped the clips, I chopped them up for you. I did the work for you guys, I did the work. I chopped up some good clips for you. So let me begin with the, uh, uh, the first clip and I'll just set it up by saying, in this first clip, he talks about how people just think, you know, when you build a product, it sells itself. Now, by the way, I should frame this whole conversation. In the conversation, uh, again, Rob is an entrepreneur, but also Jordan Peterson took a software product to market to help companies hire the right people. And in that process, and in so doing, Jordan Peterson got a taste of what it's like to be in sales. And that's what he's talking about in this conversation. It's about the entrepreneurial spirit, but also how sales plays into this whole thing called innovation and business growth. And you know, what I love about the interview is that he gives respect where respect is due, which is to salespeople us, the movers, the economic engines that move the economy. And so this first one really talks about the naivete of some people who think the product sells itself. Let me just kind of jump into the video clip and we'll start from there. First one, here you go. That's the other thing that people don't really understand is because if you're a naive entrepreneur, you think, well, all I have to do is make a great product. It's like, no, that's about 5% <laughs> yeah. of it. You know, and, and that shocked the hell out of me when I started building software, for example, mm. because we assumed that we, we, we developed software to help people um, select better employees, and we never could sell it except in, in very rare circumstances. But we assumed that if we had a product that was validated, we could show that it had the effects that we wanted and that it was more efficient than other products in the marketplace, that selling it would be easy. It's like, well, that's just so wrong. I Selling it, and marketing yeah. things is impossible. I love it when people say, oh, the product just sells itself. <laughs> it's just yeah. one of those things which yeah. are like, you've not been in business a very long time. Now, now, what I love about that clip was that, first of all, you find out that Jordan Peterson feels our pain when it comes to selling a product, in this case, a, serv uh, a software that he has. And it's interesting to kind of have him talk about it, say, look, I've tried to sell a product and it's very difficult. I just snapped, a, uh, clipped off something in, in the interview, but there he goes into in quite detail the, the, the pain of trying to sell a product. And the whole thing about, you know, you develop a good product and the product sells itself, you know, doesn't work that way. And he gets that. That's the naivete part that a lot of people think that the product sells itself. But what the underlying tone of this is that we as salespeople, we make things happen because you can have the best product. As he said, that only represents 5% of the total value. The other 95% is you and I selling that product positioning and pushing it into the market. And that's why I love that clip because one, it shows that we the salespeople are the ones that move. It isn't the product itself. If you think it's just because I create a great product, people are gonna, you know, that whole build it and they will come mindset doesn't work. Build it and then go get you some salespeople and then 
you will go to people and the money will come to you. That's kind of how it works. And I, I love this clip because you get to see a side of Jordan that, uh, that we don't typically see, right? That, that part that says you can almost categorize it as failure. I won't categorize it as failure, but the struggle to sell even his own product at his level. So uh, this should motivate you to kind of keep moving forward. Now, the next clip I got is uh, this one is about the irony or the paradox of managers within a company. And I think you're gonna find this clip just really interesting. Check it out. The, the other problem that people face when they're trying to sell a new product is one of, the one of the ways that people decide whether they're going to buy something is whether or not, A, they know anyone else who's already bought it, or B, if there's other people in their domain that are already using it. Mm. And if, if your sales pitch is, well, no, this is new and revolutionary, you think, well, that's a wonderful sales pitch. It is like it is if you're talking to someone who's entrepreneurial and risk-taking and, inter and interested in revolutionary ideas. But if you're talking to a middle manager in a company, the last thing that person wants to hear is, well, you could be a risk-taker and introduce this into your company. The person's yeah. thinking, I don't want to put my job or mm. reputation on the line for your product, even if it is revolutionary, in part because if it succeeds, I probably won't be rewarded for its success. Now, that one just blew my mind because it reveals what we as salespeople know, right? That there, there's something ironic that when, when you're talking to middle managers, right? And I'm not trying, by the way, I'm not disparaging managers. It's just a reality. And early on in the interview, he talks about the difference between an entrepreneur who's an artist. And then we talk about managers who are people who are very conscientious, right? So managers are conscientious, but they're not risk takers. And middle managers within companies typically kill, typically kill a lot of deals because they themselves don't want to take a risk. I mean, that right there, we already knew it. And if you didn't know it logically, you knew it intuitively that middle managers don't want to take risk because they have to own the risk. So when we're trying to sell a product, especially if it's a complex sale, what typically happens is, you know, we get stopped by middle managers, not because they don't think the product or service we're offering will help them. It's one, they're scared. Two, even if it goes well, they won't get the credit for it. So three, why take the risk? And sometimes we're talking to the wrong people. So as salespeople, we have to learn to sell from the top and then work our way down. It's rare that you can go from the bottom and work your way up. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's a tougher slog because sometimes, depending on the layers, it's tougher. So if you find yourself talking to middle managers, this should make you consciously aware, create some awareness here that middle managers don't want to take risk. They don't get credit because in their mind, if I'm not going to get credit for it, why should I take a risk? And they'll look to protect the status quo. And I thought that was like really interesting. Um, this next one is where he really talks about his respect for sales. And let me just go into it. Just show you this one, man. And I came out of the whole enterprise with way more respect for people, especially for people who do sales. Mm. Jesus, that's such a brutal job. Yeah. And, you know, when people are, they have a, it's easy for people to, it, it's even a popular trope to be somewhat contemptuous of salespeople, you know, all those salespeople. Definitely in so. Britain. We're very mm. reserved when it comes mm. to selling in Britain. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but, I mean, but, I don't put ads on my podcast. I mean, there's ads on virtually every American podcast. Yeah. I don't put ads. I don't need the revenue. So I, I, in a way, there's the old creative artist side of me that yeah. doesn't want to interrupt my work yeah. with ads. But like, if I started putting ads on my podcast, I, you know, some people would be okay with it. There'd be a bit of a riot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think I think that's a real mistake because it, it, it's we're no we're not giving the devil his due. It's really really hard to be a good salesperson, mm. and people like that are unbelievably rare and they're unbelievably valuable. And nothing wrong with it, and it doesn't make you a bad person, mm. and you're not selling your. Yeah. Salespeople are incredibly valuable to an organization, even he sees it. But I, I want to take a step back. Did you hear what Rob said in his interview? He said in England, over there in the UK, they're like, they don't like to sell. They sell with alligator arms, right? They're really shy about selling. They don't put any ads in the podcast. We're here in the US. We put ads in the podcast, right? Because we're not afraid of selling. That's part of our nature. I think that's that's one of the strengths of America is that our marketing, I say our marketing is really good. Our sales and marketing, I think we're one of the best in the world when it comes to sales and marketing. 
Uh, but I love the fact that, you know, I don't like, I don't like the, where Jordan used the phrase, you got to give the devil his due. I don't think he meant to use that phrase, right? But I know what he was saying. He says, again, you have to respect, I'll say, the position of salespeople and selling is necessary. So to hear it come from him was really, you know, it was really gratifying because, again, he's understanding that we don't need to be contemptuous towards sale. And this, in the next clip, he really gets into the contempt. I got two more clips and then we'll take some questions. And this one he talks about the contempt people have for selling and the arrogance associated with that contempt for selling. Here you go. It's virtually impossible for you to monetize your product. That's the first thing you have to understand. So maybe you'll get lucky and you'll figure out a, uh, a strategy. But if you add contempt for the sales and marketing process to that impossibility, you can be bloody well sure that all you're going to do is starve. Mm. So, so you better drop your contempt for the sales and marketing end of this if you, if you want to sustain yourself through your life. And that's going to be a prerequisite for your creative endeavor. Yeah. Don't confuse your ignorance of something important, sales and marketing, with your moral purity. Mm. That's a big mistake. It's a big ethical mistake, and you will pay for that. Yeah. So. Mm. So in there, I don't know if you caught it, but the first part is that, you know, there, there, is, there is this thing about salespeople, right? We have a bad rep. We have a bad rep. You know, movies like Glenn, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, uh, Arthur Miller, you know, Arthur Miller's uh, Death of a Salesman in Boiler Room and movies like that, uh, you know, that where it's always about ABC, always be closing and we're always trying to pressure people. So we as salespeople have this whole, you know, we, we got this bad rep. And what he's saying is uh, you need to kind of relook at that because that isn't fair is what he's saying. And I'm with him. But that line about ignorance, don't confuse ignorance of, as far as what you think of sales and marketing with your moral purity. What, he, what he's saying is essentially the following, my interpretation, is that a lot of people are like, I develop a product, I'm a research, I'm an engineer, I'm above selling and marketing. That's the moral piety he's talking about, that purity, right? Like I would never dirty my hands, soil my fingertips, my nails to get into sales or marketing. And the reality is, if you do that, you're just being ignorant because, again, without sales and marketing, your product or service will never make it in the market and never survive. So the last one, uh, I just added this last one, and then we'll take some questions if there are any. This last one, I just thought it was interesting because Rob talks about B2B versus B2C and his perspective on it. And I thought it was very insightful, and at least just to get another perspective of, you know this. Check it out. So I think there's some simple solutions. I almost like want to sort of summarise this part so far. I've always enjoyed selling straight to consumer yeah. and not to businesses. Yeah, I like that better um, too. I think that you've got more customers. You're always at the decision maker. Sometimes yeah. it's the husband or the wife who owns the credit card strings. Yeah. But other than that, you're always at the decision maker. You learn very intuitively and quickly. You get a quick feedback loop. Yeah. Whereas, like you said, in the, if you're dealing with a manager who's got their own motives, and then a company who's got different motives, yeah, they're not going to tell you the right. truth. You've got to unwrap yeah. all of they that. They don't even know what the no. truth is necessarily because they, they can't represent their business because they, well, they don't embody it. Yeah. That, by the way, that, that last part was brutal. And I'll just touch on it a little bit. But first is that I just thought it was interesting that in, in Rob's business, he prefers B2C because it's less complex. In other words, you're not dealing with an organization or an organism, you're dealing with people individually, right? So you can deal with the decision makers and he says you can get the credit card quickly. So I thought it was just interesting to kind of highlight that, that people actually adjust their strategy, determine what their strategy is, B2B or B2C. One isn't right, they're just like, the pros and cons for both, right? B2C, you gotta sell more volume, so to speak, where B2B, you just get two or three and boom, you're set kind of, right? The other part was that managers themselves don't realize that they're stuck within an organization. And again, they don't know, how, he said, unwrap the truth of what's really happening. In other words, when you work for a company, and this is what's really interesting, when if you're a manager and you're working for a company, now I don't want to, you know, paint every manager with the same brush here, but in general, we have managers who are part of the company and sometimes lose focus as to what the company's really trying to accomplish. And again, they're scared to do anything because they don't want to, give, they don't want to absorb the risk or they're not going to get credit for it, as I already mentioned. But I thought that was really interesting. So anyway, I found this interview and I, I, wanted, I, I was going through it and I was like, wow, Jordan Peterson really understands sales and he understands selling because he tried to sell a product. 
And that's when you learn about selling. Everybody's like, eh, I don't want to sell. Or selling is, you know, is that a real profession? Try selling a product or service. And every time I hear people talk about, you know, in, here in the U.S., you know, you got these, these, these um, you know, people talk about socialism and capitalism. You, if you guys, well, you've been out with me 65 episodes, you know I'm a capitalist, right? Because capitalism to me is, is the purest form of making an economy move, right? It's, it's about effort. We as salespeople are, as I always say, walking profit centers. What does that mean? We, 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 we eat what we kill, so to speak. In other words, we have to sell to survive. And there, there's, there's the nobility in that. I keep bringing this up. There's the nobility because when you sell, you're helping the company survive. You're helping them stay alive. And because you're helping them survive, you're supporting all the people within that company. And should you be compensated? Of course you should. In there, when, it, when uh, I think it was a uh, video number uh, four, where he talks about the contempt for salespeople, I see the contempt for salespeople mostly in the compensation packages or lack thereof. That's why I see the contempt a lot. Well, why does he make so much? Why does she make so much? Why does it have to get paid so much? Why does the commission have to be so high? Because we're selling. We're dealing with the rejections. We're the per people out there, you know, feet on the street, making the calls, sending the emails, recording the videos, trying to get the deal done. And you got people who sit in an office, have no risk, have a base salary, they're comfortable. But you and I, we have to go out there and what? Basically like this and take rejection, right? And we're not guaranteed that we're gonna make any, any real money. And so every time I've come across people who have a contempt for selling, it's usually on the compensation plan. They think that we spend our times at the golf course or playing ping pong or at the pool or whatever and making a lot of money and not doing a lot of work. But the reality is you and I know we make companies move. We are the walking profit center. So I really wanted to share this video with you because, you know, I wanted you as salespeople, as entrepreneurs, business people, bottom line, you're salespeople. I wanted you as salespeople to be proud of what you do. And it's nice to get validation from a gentleman like Jordan Peterson and Rob Moore, who are business people, who've grown businesses, who have businesses, who say selling isn't easy. It requires a very special person, very special skills, by the way, which also reminds me that if you need skills, you go to the Sales Velocity Academy. Sorry, couldn't help that. But you get the idea that when you're looking at selling, it is a skill, it is a profession, and one to be respected. On that note, I'm going to take some comments right now. Thank. You. By the way, let me know what you think of this uh, this format. I did the, the last one I did like this was with Simon Sinek when I deconstructed his presentation. Let me know what you think of me pulling some clips out like this one of Jordan Peterson. Yay. You know, you can do the whole Caesar thing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, one yes, zero don't like. So anyway, let me go get some comments right now because they've been scrolling. If I missed your comment, don't be mad. Uh, let me just start right here. Sparrow's tail. I find it crazy when people take the moral high ground over salespeople and then go to praise a certain product, coffee brand, clothing brand. I said, how do you think you found out about that product? Absolutely marketing, right? It's like when I see people say, I hate capitalism, to which I say, that's a nice smartphone you have. That's a nice Gucci bag you have on. That's capitalism. That's what it represents. Uh, let me see. Uh, what do we got here? We got Brian saying something about something. I was being, uh, anyway, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I caught the end of that. And it's not from my retail sales days. Okay, you guys are having fun on there. Uh, let me see. Uh, we got Victor. How do you think an American salesperson would fare in the UK being that Americans are a bit more aggressive. You know, see, uh, I think if you went over there, you would temper your attitude. Because I've done this. When I traveled globally, I've had to temper how I sell. Because I, every culture is different, right? And so once you figure out a rhythm. Now, by the way, I never push. I always nudge. So I always continue to nudge. For some reason, nudging for me works in any territory, right? But I noticed that, uh, for example, when I used to sell in Latin America, there was more relationship building on the front end before you got into business. I mean, I, I remember having dinners for like, you know, two, two and a half hours. No, no, not even joking about this. Two and a half hours. And then the last five minutes, we actually talked about business. And it was snap, snap, snap. And I, once you get it, you get it. So I think as long as we're not pushy, but, but I also think, you know, CF, that's also like, I wonder if that's also like a, um, a stereotype that people have of us because I, I don't think we're all pushy. Do you? I don't know. But I think, I think you would fare well. I think we'd fare well. Here in the Philippines, insurance people get, you're just after commission. Ouch. Again, if somebody tells me, 
if, look, if somebody, again, let's, TJ, this is one that would just, again, I always lean in the direction of the objection. When somebody says, Victor, you're just trying to gain a commission. I said, absolutely, of course I am. But in, in exchange for that commission, I want to make sure you're protected and you and your family are safe. That's the difference. That's a win-win. And wouldn't you agree that a win-win is always a good thing? Don't be afraid of it. I see people pull back from that like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I get a commission. No, you say, absolutely. Victor, you're just trying to get, make a sale. Yes, I am. So again, let's not pretend we're not in sales. We're in sales. Hi, Victor. What do you think about Jordan saying that the good salespeople are extremely rare? Does that mean not everybody can get there? And what are the top qualities of a top valuable one? So I think it was... Um, there was a company by, uh, that's called the Benchmark Index. I believe I got it right. Benchmark Index. And they came out with a study. Uh, uh, it's a great question, Rod, by the way. Uh, they came out with a study uh, a few years back. And, you know, I don't know how they concluded, but this was their study. So I'm just repeating the study. Benchmark Index. And it, I believe the number was 13%. One, three. 13% of salespeople are natural born salespeople. The other 87 had to learn how to become good at selling. So... Are they extremely rare? I think so. Just like, well, again, as humans, we're all extremely rare. I think different. I think, I don't know if rare is the word. I think it was, it's extremely hard to find for your particular market. So for example, if I'm in the retail business, I bet you I can find a lot of great salespeople. I bet you I can find a lot of great salespeople in the retail business. But if I move up the chain of complexity, as I move to the complex sale, I think it's harder to find great salespeople up there because now they have to know a lot more in different domains. They have to be engineers. They have to know how to deal with C-level executives. They know how, have to know the financial aspect of the business. They may have to know some marketing. So it's a different creature, so to speak. So I think what he was saying is that they're rare because, again, it was a challenge for him to sell his software. But I also think that he, did, by the way, watch the interview because in there he talks about how they worked on a deal for almost a year and then you know, they lost it in the last minute because the CEO decided to leave the company. Well, that's part of selling, right? So I think, uh, I don't know if sale, good salespeople are rare. I think the, the word he used in there, Rod, that I thought was really interesting was the word conscientious. Good word, conscientious. And it, a, a conscience, anybody can have, for example, the skill part, right? You, the IQ part. We can all learn how to be in sales. We can all learn how to be in sales. That's the IQ piece. Think of that as the, 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 the rational side, right? The skill set. But the conscientiousness is a person who is diligent in their work. Do you know what I mean? By, by diligent, I mean a person who really focuses in on getting it right. And so I think there are a lot of people who can sell, but when it comes to being conscientious, being diligent, being very good, following up, following through, that I think is tougher. That, that combination of skill and will, as I always say, uh, you know, is, is missing. But I don't know if that answered your question, but to me, the most valuable asset is conscientiousness. They want to be good. And then you just monitor their activities. Because if you're conscientious, your activities will follow. Does that make sense? In other words, if I know I have to do certain things because I'm conscientious of what I need to do in order to be good at selling, then my activities will follow that. Remember, the attitude drives the behavior. The behavior drives the consequence. So that's how I would answer that question. Uh, let me see what we got here. Uh, you guys are having a discussion. Uh, Brian says, I'm proud to be a salesperson. I think my man, Jared, had a shirt. He says, uh, uh, Jared Mitchell said, when I grow up, I want to be in sales. It was a cool shirt, man. I wish I could get one like that. Uh, we sell B2C and B2B in the cabinet business. I am an assistant to get, I am an assistant to get to their goal. If I'm constant on just my product, I come off as manipulative as com or a commodity, very satisfied. ABC kills the sale. It does, Spencer. ABC will always kill the sale. But again, it's that conscientiousness, right? If you really care about your customers and you're really trying to help them, if you understand the value of your product, then you're selling differently. You're selling it in a different way. It's, I'm not trying to sell you. I mean, look, every time I go into a meeting and I'm trying to sell my sales training program, okay, we're I'm trying to sell you, but I'm also trying to help you. And I think when you have that, I think that's the difference. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, we got, uh, let me see, we got TJ say, this is a this is Golden Insight Master View. Thank you very much. Uh, Sparrow's Tale, uh, again, you guys are just having conversation. The Deej himself is here, man. I got to say hi to my man. 
Dan Jordan. Great topic. Uh, this was the best show ever. Go check him out. This is Dan Jordan, also known as the Deej, the sales energizer. Dude, this guy's energy is off the chain, man. Check out his content. Good guy, man. Thank you for joining me, man. Uh, let me see what we got. Uh, what do we got from Inkle? One, I love the format. So I got a couple of ones, so thank you very much. Uh, it's great to dissect these videos. I remember they call Steve Jobs a genius and all, all titles of salesmen. Why is that? I don't know. Even though he was a great salesman, right? The guy could sell, man. I mean, he could just sell, man. So anyway, I'm going to start wrapping up. Uh, nudging is good. Uh, Juan Julian says, definitely approved. Very interesting, man. Thank you very much. Pete, what you got, Pete? For direct-to-customer online sales of a $50 product with limited marketing budget, how much should I plan to spend on an online campaign like Google Ads? You know, Peter, the, the, part, the tough part about answering that question, because I have to deal with that issue every day uh, with my Google Ads, it really depends. It's hard to dissect the budget. But again, if it's a $50 product, my question would be back to you. It's like, why are you selling a $50 product? Why not sell a $500 product? Is there anything you can wrap around that to make it more than $50? At $50, it's really commodity. And it's, it's harder to justify an ROI because of the, the, the click rates. You know, when you look at pay-per-click, the click rates and the click-through rates and then the conversion rates. And it really depends on the type of ads you use. You know, the graphic you use, the video you use. There's so many things that depend on it. I would go, you know, try to, you know, get in touch with a social media expert who can help you with that. But uh, my big question to you, Peter, would be why not sell a more, you know, expensive product? Respectively, how long... Uh, it will take to see whether or not the campaign works. It depends, Peter. You know what I mean? Again, I would I would move up the the, the, the food chain a little bit. Uh, that's strong, Victor. Thank you very much. TJ, yeah, I agree with you, VA. I'm not affected with that line anymore. Yeah, just lean into that objection, right? VA, it's been two years after registration on the Sales Velocity Academy. ROI has been great for me and my team. KC1, thanks, bruh. My man. Sales Velocity Academy. If you haven't joined, check it out, man. Uh, thank you very much, man. I appreciate you, man. All right, I'm going to start wrapping up here. I know you guys got some more questions. I like your analysis, and yes, you should do more of these. I think it's natural for you, and you're doing it elegantly. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Appreciate that. Um, let me see. We got a long one here. Let me grab this long one here. This is a big one from Corey, man. Corey, let me see. Americans are not more aggressive. We are more assertive. Yeah. By the way, and anybody who's traveled into the international regions, there's some cultures that are very assertive, right, Corey? Very assertive. I like the way you put that. That's very well put, man. Being assertive entails taking subtle control of the deal by ever adapting to uh, our qualified prospects, their needs, and planting seeds to guide them to take action at the time of close. We do not convince. Rather, we persuade in short We'll thrive in the UK too. But I can't argue with this, man. I can't argue with this guy. You're absolutely right. Because, I mean, and again, it's, there's a difference between aggressive and assertive and Corey, man. I love what you said. All right, I'm wrapping up. I'm getting out of here. Final thoughts. Final thoughts of the, on this one. Now, again, I want you to go below. Check out Rob Moore's interview with Jordan Peterson. And I, I, I'm hoping that the video will accomplish one big thing. Oh, by the way, before I forget... If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. If you haven't liked or shared this video, do that right now before you forget. And one of the things about, I like about Rob Moore's video is that, and the conversation with Jordan, first of all, it's, you could tell it's not scripted. It's just like off the cuff. But, but, I, but I think if you've ever questioned yourself, and I know you guys don't have an identity crisis. I don't think so. I don't think so. But I think it's worth watching to kind of remind yourselves like I, I enjoyed watching because it, it reminded me of why I like doing sales and why it's important to be proud of what you do. You know what I mean? And just really wear that brand, the big S for salesperson in the front. And so, but watch because there's a lot of subtleties in that interview. But the big takeaway for me was stop being contempt, contemptuous, he uses the word, of selling. So when people hate salespeople, it's not you, it's them. They have an issue with it. And I think a lot of people who don't like salespeople is because they had a bad sales experience or they can't do it themselves, right? But when a lot of people tell me, Victor, I can't sell. It's just not in me. Anybody can sell. So I go back to, he says, uh, Rod highlighted uh, our salespeople, extremely rare. I think we're a rare breed in the sense that you have to be 
like tough. I mean, you got to be like Teflon. Stuff has to like just slide off of you when people say no. So in that case, we, we're extremely rare. But anybody, anybody can learn how to sell. I've seen both extremes, introvert, extrovert, and everything in between. And so the other thing I, I wanted to highlight was when he talks about selling, Again, sometimes when we're selling into a B2B complex sale, we get stuck in middle managers. Maybe it's time to start aiming higher. And a lot of us hesitate to go high because we think, well, I don't know. I don't think I've just earned the right to call at a high level. If that's what you believe, I think you're wrong. And too often we think calling middle managers is an easier way to get to the top. And I'm telling you right now, I'd rather start at the top and work my way down. It's always worked out better. Um, the last part is, remember, uh, when people look at selling, we have to remind them that without it us, their business doesn't exist. You can have the best product. What do you call it? It's naive to think that you can have a great product and people will show up. And that I want to leave you on that note. They need us. We're salespeople. They need us. And I'm telling you again, if you learn to be a salesperson and you study there, if you learn the skill of selling, you'll always have a job. And that is my firm belief. And on that note, Thank you for joining me. This is Victor Antonio, Sales After Dark. Why? Because money never sleeps. And remember, selenate hard when you know how. Take care, guys. We'll see you on Tuesday. I got a new piece of technology for you. See you.